Prepare for the extraction point. We've been briefed on all the important stories and events in the world of emerging information. Now, it's time to extract the data and turn it into action. Live from the SiliconANGLE studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, this is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Understand, but but please tell, tell us a little bit about who away. you are and your background. Well, uh, I was trained first as a chemist and then in, in Berkeley uh, as a nuclear scientist. I was doing experiments in, uh, in particle physics, and what happened was we actually couldn't understand the data we were taking. Now, at that time, it was only six-dimensional, but so I started working. Only. Only, Only yeah. six dimensional. Oh, believe me, that's, that <laughs> changed That's quickly. kindergarten. Uh, but so I started working first on batch programs to try and understand it, right. which marginally successful. And I said, but, but I'm, I really don't understand what's going on. And sometimes there were problems in the experiment. So I developed uh, the first interactive system at Berkeley and then actually connected it to the real-time ex experiment so you could see things as they were coming in. And um, we had such success with that about understanding but the time it took me to do that the, the six dimensions it had become 12 <laughs> and so I had to do more <laughs> and uh, it, it turns out that um, I spent more and more time trying to develop tools to handle complex information and uh, when I finished my degree, I did a did a post a doc in nuclear physics. But then the choice came: Do I stay in physics, or do I go into computing? And I, I decided um, I really liked. I, I, I it was something very satisfying about understanding what was happening. Of course, now we're probably up to 15 dimensional data, and uh, so I spent not only did I spend time um, developing uh, software, interactive software personal software but uh, then the machines weren't fast enough so I started designing computers <laughs> <laughs> that would, uh, it's a moving uh, train uh, right you know? you <laughs> but You're the, the reason that's interesting is that uh, if, if I had a comment to other people in, in the field is to me the computer has always been a means to an end to understand whatever it is I'm trying to understand not an end in itself, and I, I worry at times that people who were trained in computer science, they come up with the computer being the end result. And often I have encountered, uh, sadly, people in very prominent positions that don't really understand how people use the computer. Yep. And that's, that's sad. Uh, to me, no software that I've developed, uh, no hardware that I've developed, has any other purpose than to help me and others understand. And if it doesn't do that, it really isn't worth my time and effort. So, so talk a little bit about this, uh, this example that you shared with the audience today. Oh. This is a fascinating We um, We developed, uh, we started uh, um, as a advanced research program at Sandia uh, over a decade ago. Uh, essentially, it was using, at that time, the catchphrase was virtual reality was immersive environments and um, we had the idea that I don't like the term virtual reality but that this stuff puts you close to information it wasn't we were like we were trying to create uh, a, a reproduction of say this building we were putting you in places where you can't go in real life and if we do this in a way that plays to the uh, human function, the way, the way humans actually interact with their space, that learning would increase. And uh, we, we were successful there. We were so successful that it uh, spun out as a, uh, from Sandia as a uh, private company, then went public. And uh, uh, the successes across the board, what we did was develop a system which, when, when you interact with your computer there, you're bending your will to it. You interact the way it tells you to interact. Sure, you, right. you use a keyboard, yeah. even mouse clicks and stuff like that, 
that's not the way you do things, as, as I said in, in my talk. Imagine if you had to drive a car the way you operate your computer. That you put some virtual buttons, let's say, that came down three-dimensionally and you would press them and you wouldn't drive the car. <laughs> but you will run your computer that way. And what people have lost sight of, and one of the, one of the things I mentioned, a study done by IBM some years ago, they, they were interested in productivity. And so they did a, a, a test where they had a CAD program, a design program, and they would give people a specific thing to do. What they didn't know was between the time you said do this, you hit the key, and the time the answer came back, they had put on a little knob that varied. So they could, they could put a delay in. They wanted to see how that delay, just between clicking the key and the result, how did that affect your productivity? Well, it, they started lowering the time, lowering the time, they got down to a second, and productivity was shooting up. And I said, okay, you know, one second response. Then they lowered it, half a second, productivity shot up. Three tenths of a second, productivity shot up. It's like, my God. The faster we go, what happens when the computer is truly responding to you? As fast as you can ask questions, you get answers. Your whole way of working changes. It's it's like a video game. You become engrossed. So so question for you. I mean, obviously, the personal computer revolution had a lot to put in place to kind of put these static or you know glass ceilings, if you will, relative to the the design. But with cloud and mobility, you know, Eric Schmidt was, has been talking about, you know, Google design for mobile. So it's an opportunity for young, you know, smart guys in Berkeley or wherever to design the next gen product. What would you advise them? What would you share with them and say, okay, as mobile, which is an opportunity to change the game a bit? Because now you have form factor changes. It's potentially a new car where the PCs, the horse and, and buggy, mobile could be the car, if that's a, well, could be if it's stretched. But, but if there's an opportunity to influence a generation, what would you say? I mean, you know, throw it away, redevelop, build a platform. What I would say is, in, based on actual real world experience that we've had, and it's, this may be hard for you to believe, if you uh, provide a human interface to that data, now I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be a little demanding. I'm going to tell you you need between the time I query and the time the result comes back that better be less than a second. And the way I interact with it is not pushing buttons and stuff. You free me again. Think about driving a car. Think about what you do. When you, you don't look at your hands. You don't look where buttons are, and yet. When you're driving a car, I mean, you're taking in, you don't think you are, you're taking in motor noise. You say, well, I don't hear the motor noise. You let the motor make a ping and see if you don't hear it. Vibration from the road. You go, I don't feel the vibration. Yes, you do. <clears throat> Your mind processes the roughness of the road. It processes, and you can be talking to someone and you can have the radio on. You're doing all of these things in real time and you're not breaking a sweat. Make the computer respond like that. If you make the computer respond like that, to these large data sets. If you allow people to ask questions, and, and that, that's really the miraculous thing. No one knows what's in the data sets. No one. Even people that think they do, I will guarantee yeah, yeah. you there's surprises in them. Is there, is there an, uh, an analogy in your mind to chemistry uh, with content? I mean, the data is ultimately, it's information, there's different elements of data, different meanings, different databases. In a way, it's almost like a chemistry, or it's physics and chemistry kind of blending together. Because if you want to have a low latency response like that, you got to have a new way to interface with the data yes. at, a root, at a root level. Absolutely you do. And, and do something different. So. I guess that's kind of a mind-blowing <laughs> mind um, position to kind of get these young computer but it's scientists. Got, but it's gotten easier. Um, when I started this work, I mean, you know, virtual reality at the time was uh, w was a big thing. I didn't, I didn't, and still don't like that uh, the name virtual reality. But people developed interfaces. But they were trying, in my opinion, they weren't trying to use them for data. They were trying to use them for Hollywood and various other things. 
But we've come a long way. I mean, you can buy a stereo TV now. Very inexpensive, a stereo TV. So I can show you your data in three dimensions on your own stereo TV. The advent of many of the game systems, uh, which give you, which will recognize hand motions and things like that. Now, that can be used as a gimmick. Every, all of this stuff can be used yeah. as a gimmick. But it can also be used to help you. You want to turn, you want to turn a data set around? Just do that. Yeah, what a Just bit is to what a bit is to a byte. You need to think about large data sets in that kind of reference because you have to act on a whole new processor, a whole new operating environment has to kind of be created. I mean, don't you? Is it, is it a yeah. recreation or is it a? Well, it's you know? it, it, historically uh, in business, uh, uh, if you were a computer company and someone, two people came to you with a plan for something new. And one of them was to enhance the user interface, and the other one was make the processor 10% faster. Would you like to bet which one would get the money? And the reason is because having the processor go 10% faster is something that can go up on a sign. You can use it in advertising. Yeah, it's a gimmick. The fact that I made a user 50% faster, that's much more difficult to quantify, and they didn't put the money there. They, because they didn't think it would be bring returns. But we are reaching the point now where the whole conference, you're drowning in data. And I will tell you from firsthand real world problems, we have accelerated people's comprehension and understanding of data three orders of magnitude, 1,000 times. Can you give us an example? Good. Is sure. that good or bad in your mind? Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. You ought to see it. Three orders of magnitude. Yeah. Three orders it's, of magnitude. It's Let Moore's me, Law for the no, brain. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you yeah. two that, that sort of illustrate it. In the first case, we had a company that will remain nameless, one of the largest uh, chip manufacturers in the country, that had prototyped a... <laughs> AMD. Uh. <laughs> I, I'm not telling you who it is. But Can't be that, Intel. That had um, <laughs> prototyped a new chip, and they had five different programs that run analysis on it, uh, vibrational, heat, electrical, and they were trying to figure out, you know, they had, they had screens that they could bring these data up on. We fused it, turned it into a chip, allowed you to fly around it. The uh, engineer in charge found that there was a flaw in the design in 15 minutes and corrected it. Didn't know it was there. 15 minutes. They'd had it for four months. That's not the story. The story is, as uh, 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 item of curiosity, we actually queried people in the company, so who knows the least about electricity? One gentleman volunteered his wife and said she still blows the circuits out in the house. So we actually brought her in. We put her down in the same model. We did not talk about volts or amps or circuits or ASICs or anything. There was color flowing over this. There was sound and she could fly and she could touch things and things would happen. She really didn't know what she was doing. But you know what? Something went red, sounds went off. What the hell? What's going on? What happened? I said, well, I don't know. Figure it out. She went over, she went down. Look, is there something going on here? And she, she found the problem. And she suggested a solution to that problem. Now, the only difference between her and the double E is it took her 30 minutes instead of 15. <laughs> It's fascinating. So the human mind is its own processor. So what, you, what you're getting at is, is that the current state of what computers have been designed for is like a horse and buggy. And that there's yet that and there's, there's people get funded based upon certain you know, standards. But a new standard kind of needs to evolve. I'll give, you, I'll give you one more example in a Great. different area. Okay. This one I can mention because time, enough time's passed. Um, Roger Penske and Goodyear Tire and Rubber. Penske was running race cars, obviously, and he was losing races, not by a lot, by fractions of a second. And, um, but it was continuous. This was bad. Yeah. Why are we losing races? <clears throat> I couldn't figure it out. So they instrumented the car. They put telemetry on it that would NASA would put to shame. <laughs> they broadcast it on five different tracks, full races, brought all the data back. Set a team of people down. Okay, why are we losing races? 
Two years later, they hadn't a clue. Now, they were using the same sorts of interfaces, frankly, that you see here. They spread graphs, comparative graphs of all the stuff, sliced this way. But they didn't know what they were looking for. They just knew they were losing raises. And somewhere in that information was the answer to why they were losing raises. Well, Penske, after spending <coughs> several million dollars, said, okay, we're getting nowhere on pulling the plug. And as a uh, last resort, they came to us. And it took us about two months to build the model with all that data in it, all of it, simultaneous, 20 dimensions. There wasn't a number showing. There was no graph showing. None of that. Wheels on the, on the car would morph in size as the pressure changed. You'd, you'd think it's cartoonish, but everything that was happening was exaggerated so that as you drove the car, you could see it. You could experience it. Five minutes, they found the answer. Two years, nothing. But the computer didn't find it. The human mind found it. Yeah. I just... They just had the data in front That's of them. That's been a big theme there. in this conference is the human aspect of data curation. So like, you know, in the, in the linguistics world, you'd have to have the, some knowledge around, you know, ontologies, which has been a field in AI and academic, where, you know, machines can do something. Mm -hmm. But without human interaction, this data stuff doesn't work because there is an element of humanness that needs to kind of interface with the machine. And we've heard a little bit of that from some of the data science guys, but I well, never even, thought about it at that level. Even Joseph Turian, who was here, he was talking, we asked him about Watson. He said, well, the interesting thing about Watson is there's humans involved in optimizing <laughs> it. It's not just machines. So. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we, yeah. I, I gave an example of, a, of something that's going on at the University of Washington called Folded. Folded, uh, they had a program. They're trying to figure out how proteins, complex proteins, because they, they fold together. And it's important for them to understand um, how they're folded because that affects how they interact with other things in the body. And so they, had, they have a computer program, been developed for years, that tries to figure out how a given protein will fold. The guy thought, well, I wonder if hum how humans would do on that problem. So he got a bunch of gamers. They had done they had 10 problems that they'd submitted to the computer, gave the same 10 problems to the gamers. And the results went like this. Of the ten problems, gamers beat the computer five times, tied it three times. Two of the times they didn't get a solution at all, and the computer did. Unfortunately, the computer solution was wrong in both of those cases. So their conclusion from that is actually the best way is a human-computer interaction. Let let the gamers, I mean, I, you can go through why that happened. What Gamers were willing to take risks that the computer weren't. They had a long view. They changed strategies when a strategy wasn't working. They didn't keep crunching. Mm -hmm. And they found, they even knew how to start the problem better than the computer did. So if you want, and, and that applies to the big data, if you want to have effectiveness, work at a human-computer hybrid, which means you want the human to act with optimal efficiency. You want them to really be engaged. And I think, I think computer gaming is an example. People get hooked on the games because of the feedback. It is. It where, are you, where are you guys located? Are you in the Bay New area? Mexico. New Mexico. Okay, so. Um, Different card. You have yes. a card. We'd like to keep in touch with you. We really appreciate the uh, the insight, and and I really think it's quite relevant. Um, as you know, data science and, and computer science and social science and cognitive science kind of all intersect here. And again, this is where the you know, I mean, the embryonic stage of this entire revolution. But mobile is driving a lot of change. So really appreciate the insight and experience, and uh, love to have you back and kind well, of mentor uh, some thank of the you younger. No, The company is Event Horizon. Uh, it's uh, Event Horizon Corp. Dot com and. Uh, this is Dr. Creve Maples, who's the CEO, so thanks.